Hello everyone, welcome back to the analyst for 6th of April 2024 where we will be trying to understand the most important articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express. Now looking at the table of contents, we find the very first article is about a very important concept which is known as the central bank digital currency. In the next article, we will be trying to understand the green hydrogen initiatives in India and the various basics concepts related to the same. In the third article, we will be looking into why the parliament's functioning is a very very important aspect for democracy and we will be also looking at the various important data and trends in the in the fourth article, we will be looking at a very very serious issue which is known as antimicrobial resistance and the various initiatives that the government of India has also taken in the same. And in the final and the fifth article, we will be looking into an important term which is known as a qualified institutional placement and this is a very very important term in India's financial sector. And finally, we will be wrapping up the discussion with prelim snippet which will be aiding your quick revision for the prelims and this will be news in shorts. Now in the very first news article, recently in the latest monetary policy committee meeting, the RBI has extended the idea of central bank digital currencies to non-banks and particularly with respect to central bank digital currencies retail. And what are all these terms? I know it may be kind of confusing for you all. So let us understand the very basics and also the very advanced concepts of this central bank digital currency. Now this is a very very important section for your prelims and also for your GST mains where we have the various concepts of economics involved. Now to start with, let me tell you at the very beginning that this concept of central bank digital currency is also known as e-rupee or digital money or digital rupee. So any term related to the same is exactly synonymous to central bank digital currencies. So for my own reference and for my own benefit, I will be using electronic rupee or e-rupee. Now e-rupee as a very central idea of India's monetary system was exactly introduced in a union budget of 2022-2023. And here the RBI has sought to introduce digital currencies e-rupee using RBI's own blockchain technologies and some other technologies too. Now here, before beginning the core aspects of e-rupee, let me tell you that money over a period of time has evolved from barter system to the present fiat money that we have and also the legal tender that we have and finally to the next age of currencies which we know as digital currencies. Now digital currencies were initially the idea of a private individual who thought that okay can we also create money without the involvement of government without the involvement of banks so that kind of money is also is exactly known as cryptocurrencies now cryptocurrencies are based on blockchain technology which we can imagine are you know huge network of private computers which are privately owned by say individuals like you and me only without any government's interference. So any network that is actually held by the private individuals to generate cryptocurrency, right? One of the functions of the blockchain technology is to generate cryptocurrencies within the same. Now here the cryptocurrencies by nature is private in nature. So there is no government. Now RBI thought that okay, can we not have our own or India's own blockchain technology and can we not issue money or issue currency using RBI's own blockchain. So this is the basically the idea of CBDCs or e-rupee. Now CBDCs are actually based on RBI's own blockchain and this is very very different from Bitcoin, Ethereum or other cryptocurrencies which are based on blockchain technologies of various private individuals. Right. So this is the first most difference between cryptocurrencies and central bank digital currency. CBDCs are based on RBI's own blockchain. Other cryptocurrencies are based on other blockchain. So we can understand CBDCs are actually based on governments of India's own blockchain or RBI's own blockchain. Now here we have to understand the second important aspect of here. Uh, what is the main difference between electronic rupee or e-rupee and the physical money that we have. Now let me tell you at the very beginning there are no differences. For Imagine for example uh, if we have the 100 rupees note in our wallets right that is a physical note that we have or the physical coins that we have. Exactly the same thing has been replicated on the blockchain of RBI in the nature of electronic rupee. That means the same note of 100 rupees is available on the blockchain of RBI in uh, containing the same serial numbers of the notes containing the same identification markers of a currency in India right so entirely the same idea is based on the digital platform so we can understand that the money that is physical 
physically present with us and the money that we have in our uh, CBDCs they are exactly the same because both of them are actually issued by the RBI right and let me tell you since this digital money or electronic rupee is is actually uh, you know issued by the RBI they are also legal tender because we have to understand to uh, for, for any money to become a legal tender first it has to become a fiat currency or that it has to measure value and it has to be issued by an authority such as a central bank of a country secondly it has to be valid for transactions it has to be valid for transactions under various acts of the country for example in India if we have the 100 rupee 500 rupee co notes and coins in the country we generally have that note backed up under the RBI act of 1934 so it is the act or it is a statute that is making the various currencies in the you know in our country valid for transaction that only then only we can tell that currency as a legal tender so CBDC is also issued by the uh, RBI and also we can use the CBDCs for transactions and for whatever purposes and it is also a legal tender under the RBI Act of 1934 now here we have to understand that if we transact using CBDCs we have to store CBDC somewhere so RBI has told okay uh, people of India can actually have an account directly with the RBI and that account is actually known as e-rupee wallet and within that wallet people can store money with directly with the RBI and here we have to understand whatever money that we add into this wallet we can add the money from our bank accounts we can add money from uh, say various other sources for example if you're receiving salary from somewhere so your firm company or the government of India can also credit salaries directly into your uh, wallets so these are the various ways in which you can add money to your wallets but we have to understand instead of having these wallets with the banks we are having a direct connection of your money supply and your uh, you know wallets and your deposits with the RBI right so here also we can understand we can see that sometimes in this architecture we may not even need banks we can directly have an account with the RBI and everything will be happening within the same and also sometimes the RBI can also say that the money that is stored in your CBDC wallet can have a time limit that means that you cannot for example in some cases store the money in your wallet forever you have to use it or say it can come with an expiry date and finally we have to also know the difference of CBDCs with UPI you know that UPI is actually the funds that you transfer directly in real time from your bank accounts right but often that transaction is not in real time so uh, the UPI is actually a digital platform between various banks and a kind of a communication system between the various banks that person A has sent person B money and that uh, you know transaction message has to be settled instantly while the funds may be settled after 24 hours or sometimes it even may be delayed but in CBDCs the funds are instantly transferred between any two people or any two businesses and whatsoever right so this is the main difference between the UPI and the CBDCs now here there was a 2018 PYQs a PYQ question related to the Beam UPI app now uh, you know uh, according to this uh, Beam UPI and the UPI ecosystem to sign up for the UPI ecosystem you need to do some various verification tasks right that is reflected in option 2 and your option 2 is inherently wrong because it's still that beam app has only two factors of authentic authentication see factors of authentication is very very important to identify that it is your bank account it is your deposit account you need a particular pin you have to have a card to uh, operationalize, uh, operationalize the UPI account right so these are very very important for security purpose of the network now in the comments let me know what will be the actual answer with respect to the statement too. Now the purpose of uh, me showing you this PYQ is that uh, they have asked, UPSC has asked question related to the UPI's factors of authentication. They can also ask the same with reference to CBDCs. So what I mean is that how can you actually sign up for the CBDCs and what are the various factors of authentication that you have to obey here. Now firstly uh, if you if you want to uh, add money to your CBDC account first you have to download uh, the particular CBDC app from the Play Store according to your bank and then you have to have the same uh, card which is linked to your bank account present in your phone so that is the very first step of authentication the second tip is the second step is that for the app for the application CBDC application you need to set up a pin then you need to set up a wallet pin also is a third factor then you have to link your bank account 
right with your mobile phone in this cbdc app this is the fourth fourth factor the fifth and final factor is actually adding your card details which is linked to your bank account right so here you have to add your card details the last six digit of your card number and finally when you have completed all the five steps or five factors of authentication then you will be having access to your cbdc account now after you have access to your cbdc account suppose you want to add money to your wallet how to do that see upsc can ask these very basic questions right that is why i am explaining you all these things see when you want to load some money or add account uh, add money to your account cbdc account you can add any number that you want so suppose you want to add 190 rupees here now see look at here now this 190 rupees will be added in terms of digital notes remember in the very first point i told you that there are no differences between physical and digital notes in the cbdc because both are legal tenders just that our physical money in 100 rupees 500 rupees notes and 2 rupees coins we have in physical form cbdc's are entirely on a digital form so here whenever you will be adding money you will be actually issued some digital notes with particular serial numbers and denominations mentioned on the top and when you have added you have to add money from your bank account there has to be a source from where you are adding money so that will be from your bank account for example icic bank here and then finally you have to uh, add money and your message will be coming and finally your money will be loaded so this is the entire process how you can start downloading from the app and directly to add money in your bank account and after you have added money you can send money and you can collect money from people and you can redeem any other codes and other facilities of the same now here we have to discuss the main benefits of this particular electronic rupee firstly is that uh, you know in india we have two channels of cbdc's because we have to understand there are two kinds of stakeholders in the entire economy retail and wholesale now retails are individuals like you and me who do transactions on a day to day basis retails are also the uh, stakeholders who are doing businesses such as running cafes and say uh, you know particular manufacturing industry and so on so these are the people who will be using the retail cbdc's now there are other kind of people also wholesale individuals such as banks such as sometimes even the state governments and so on who actually transfers money or uses money in large and large amount of volumes so the first benefit is that that the rbi has actually identified two different channels for better efficiency of this network next the entire technology is based on a blockchain technology which is very safe and which is very secure and with present state of technologies it is extremely difficult to hack the uh, blockchain technology and particularly the blockchain technology of the rbi so your money is actually very very safe and secure with the rbi and here all the transaction that you do on the system is actually very very traceable because this wallets that you are having is directly with the rbi so low scope of corruption low scope of money laundering low scope of terrorism activities terror finance and so on and also low scope of counterfeiting of notes because obviously this is the account that we have directly with the banks uh, directly with the rbi and the rbi is issuing you digital notes with individual serial numbers and this can not be counterfeited just like physical coins are very easy to counterfeit and we have instances where the counterfeit notes and coins are actually flowing in from our neighborhood countries such as pakistan nepal and so on that kind of issue is totally eliminated or so we can have some uh, scope of reduction in the same next obviously we find that if we issue more and more digital currencies or if rbi is issuing more and more digital currencies the cost of printing physical currencies will be going down so maybe at one time in the future say 50 or 100 years from now on maybe we'll be entirely only transacting using physical uh, sorry digital currencies right so there will be no cost of printing of currencies or physical currencies so this will save a lot of funds for the governments and then we can also have interlinking of various central banks of the various countries so that will be easing the you know cross border transactions because as of now we can understand that if we want to send money uh, to our parents or to our relatives from a abroad nation we have to pay various bank fees and settlement charges now with respect to central bank digital currencies rbi or say federal bank of america and so on the central banks of the various uh, countries they need not need to pay any transaction costs because obviously they these are from government to uh, you know from central bank to central bank transactions of digital money so this is also an area where the central banks have to actually work on to ease the cross-border transactions again these cross-border transactions will be decreasing the scope of 
illegal activities, black market activities and also money laundering and trader financing. And finally, this will be also assuring the financial inclusion aspect. Right now, this latest monetary policy committee has told that we can include more and more non-banks, non-banks or non-banking companies, right? Particularly, we can also include the NBFCs apart from the banks from issuing the CBDCs which have been issued by the RBI to them. So this will be ensuring that more and more companies, more and more startups, more and more individuals will be actually using this mechanism and more and more financial inclusion will also be uh, possible. Sometimes the RBI or the government can also directly send money into these accounts. Now there are some challenges also, particularly the cost of maintenance of the entire servers of the CBDCs. It is very very uh, difficult and very very expensive to maintain the blockchain technology servers and ecosystem and the technology related to the same. So the cost will be very very high in this manner. Second, you know that the entire transaction system in CBDCs is actually monitored by the RBI. So there can be privacy concerns of some individuals, some individuals who may not want to show their transactions to the public or to the government. Now that is also a kind of an issue, that is also kind of a debate, right, whether this kind of transactions should be uh, available with the RBI or not. And finally, we can also see that since banks are not needed directly because people are directly having wallets with the RBI, now banks can also see weakening of their capabilities because we find that the loaning capacity or the credit facilities are actually provided by the banks via money multiplier or fractional reserve banking. So they use the banks use people's deposits to give loans to the individuals and the various other individuals. Now see if the people are keeping wallets directly with the RBI. Now that the people's deposits are only with the RBI, the people's deposits are not with the banks, then how can the banks create new money. So that is an issue that the RBI can also fix by actually giving some quota of the CBDCs to the banks and then the banks can allow those CBDCs among its various customers. So this was all the things that you need to understand regarding CBDCs. Now here we have uh, 2023 PYQs. I want the answer in the comment section because all the things, most of the things we have discussed here. In the next article, we'll be looking into green hydrogen initiatives and the various uh, nudges and the push that the government of India is giving in the same because recently around 500 crores has been allotted to the green energy generation, particularly to the transportation system in the country. Now here, this is very, very important for prelims uh, with respect to the various concepts of environment ecology. With, GS, with respect to GS3, we have infrastructure where we have energy. And with respect to GS3, again, we have the aspects of conservation, environmental pollution and degradation. Now here, let us discuss the very basics first as to how green hydrogen energy is actually generated. Or in the very beginning, let us, assume, let us actually understand how hydrogen uh, uh, or the various kinds of uh, uh, hydrogen and the various uh, you know, generation of hydrogen energy is actually possible. Now, Hydrogen can be generated using two ways. Firstly, using non-fossil fuel and then using fossil fuel. Now you see, when we are not using fossil fuel, you can uh, generate using uh, wind energy, solar energy. That kind of hydrogen is actually known as green hydrogen. When you are generating uh, uh, hydrogen uh, using nuclear energy, we know that as pink uh, hydrogen. When we are uh, mixing the various uh, uh, kind of non-fossil fuel sources, we have yellow hydrogen. Now you understand that green hydrogen is actually de derived from very clean sources like wind uh, energy, hydropower or even sometimes solar energy. So here the, uh, uh, the amount of greenhouse gas footprint or the impact on the environment from green hydrogen which is, is actually minimal. Similarly from nuclear energy it is very very minimal and also from yellow hydrogen it can be mixed or medium. And from the various fossil fuels we can actually get blue hydrogen if we get it from natural gas or coal, turquoise if we get from natural gas, grey hydrogen if we get from natural gas again by autothermal reforming or steam methane reforming. We can get brown hydrogen from brown coal and coal gasification. We get black hydrogen from black coal right via coal gasification again and we have another kind of uh, hydrogen uh, energy which is kind of unassigned no color has been assigned to it yet which is actually generated from biomass. And if you can see here 
if you can see in this you look at this part here the other kind of hydrogen generated by via various other sources and given various colors is actually kind of having some bearing on the environmental aspect so right now the government is actually focusing on more and more generation of green hydrogen because uh, the hydrogen gas the h2 gas that is actually generated from green hydrogen can be used into many uh, sectors such as transportation sector, agricultural sector, energy sector and so on. So that is why the government is focusing on generating green uh, hydrogen and how to do that? Firstly, you need some renewable uh, you know, sources like wind, water, sun. Then you have to generate electricity from the same. Now when you have generated electricity from green sources, you have to feed water or say you have to take electricity and you have to take water and uh, put it in the electrolyzer and you know an electrolyzer will be uh, separating the ions of oxygen and hydrogen according to the cathode and anode properties according to the you know chemical properties now the hydrogen which has been separated using electrolysis is actually extracted and stored in containers where we have the pure hydrogen gas which can then be stored and then can be used in various applications particularly the government of india right now is actually finding the applications very very suitable of green hydrogen in uh, the transportation sector in the uh, you know uh, energy sector and so on and here we find that nowadays uh, most of the hydrogen gas which is generated is actually gray in nature or it is generated from the fossil fuels which are polluting in nature and that is why the union cabinet uh, uh, is has actually also recently approved the national green hydrogen mission because the government is expecting many benefits that will be arising from the green hydrogen generation firstly we have to understand it will be reducing pollution because if we generate hydrogen using gray hydrogen or say using no uh, using fossil fuels it will be obviously polluting uh, you know pollutants in the atmosphere and it will be you know leading to greenhouse effects and so on Next, it will be also meeting India's Panchamrit ambitions. India tends to achieve 500 gigawatts of energy from non-fossil fuel energy sources. And here, green hydrogen is actually derived from renewable sources that is non-fossil fuel. And here, if we understand, if we meet our climate ambitions of Panchamrit, which is uh, finally we have to uh, become net zero by 2070, this is the good way to go uh, across next if we understand that uh, you know our dependence on the coal imports on the crude oil imports is increasing over a period of time and specifically because we need to power our energy needs power our cars trucks and so on via fossil fuels but green energy can also do the same green hydrogen can also do the same and it will be reducing our dependence on imports and finally finally if we develop this mission of generating green energy and properly establishing a proper infrastructure regarding the same. We can also build India into a global hub for the exports of green hydrogen energy too. So we have the many opportunities which is awaiting for us. But here we have to understand there are also various challenges which we will be discussing at the very end. Now here the main aspect of this article is actually regarding this latest initiative taken by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy Scheme. Now here uh, around 496 or 500 crores have been allotted to the production and generation and distribution of green hydrogen energy in the country. Now for that, uh, the ministry is actually looking into the various technical feasibility performance of green, uh, green hydrogen as a transportation fuel. So as of now, the ministry is actually looking into the prospects, right? So it has, it, it, it is actually studying the various market conditions, various amount of practical real life uh, generation of uh, green hydrogen in the country. Next, it will be also evaluating how the economic viability of green hydrogen powered vehicles would be in the future. That means, see, uh, uh, setting up green energy or say green hydrogen energy plants or say setting up the entire uh, say wind energy hydro energy and the electrolyzer and the storage and distribution of this green uh, hydrogen is very very costly to set up that is why the private sector right now is not very enthusiastic so the government thought that okay let us give some funds for the setup uh, for the setting up of this initial green hydrogen projects that is actually by the involvement of the government uh, by providing some money to the private sector and the private sector also investing their own money. This is actually a form of investment uh, uh, kind of a, a project which is also known as viability gap funding where the government can give up to say 40-60% of the entire cost of the project 
and the rest of the cost will be given by the private sector this is actually what is known as uh, fulfilling the gap between the projects that are socially desirable but which are not say commercially feasible right so the socially desirable effects the economically desirable effects can be seen with respect to green hydrogen but also commercially undesirable why because the because of the heavy costs and finally uh, the ministry also wants to demonstrate the safe operation of hydrogen powered vehicles because hydrogen storage is a very very high pressure intensive activity even with respect to the cng cylinders that we have which is already uh, you know be, uh, stored under high pressure the hydrogen uh, uh, gas is actually needed to be stored in further high pressures so there is also safety concern regarding the same now here why the government is pushing for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles now you know that the government recently is also pushing for more and more electric vehicles based on battery technologies of lithium ion apart from that the government is also exploring the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles where the uh, you know the main generation of the the main combustion engine of the cars and the various trucks in the country would be actually based on the hydrogen fuels now here this hydrogen fuel will be doing what they will be using the utilizing the hydrogen gas which is generated from green sources and they will be generating it and they will be utilizing it electrochemically by converting hydrogen gas stored in high pressurized tank into electricity that will be driving the car so this will be an electric car which will be based from hydrogen not on battery cells okay so this electricity will be driving the car forward and the only waste or say the leftover will be water h2o so this h2o will not be essentially leading into any environmental degradation now uh, hydrogen fuel cells uh, vehicles are actually much lighter than the battery electric uh, vehicles as we know that lithium is comparatively heavier than hydrogen and also if we compare if we compare the distance which over which the electric vehicles can actually travel we find that they do not have a large uh, say range of distance to be covered uh, uh, you know if we, if we compare the uh, vehicles which are filled by hydrogen such as big trucks and even cars we find that they actually can travel on over a longer distance over a longer period of time because hydrogen is very very light and it can be heavily compacted heavily uh, compressed and stored in the fuel cells of the cars so that uh, especially heavy duty trucks can uh, you know transport uh, uh, goods and services over a long period of range now we obviously understand the various benefits of these hydrogen uh, fuel uh, uh, cars and vehicles but there are number of challenges firstly we need a lot and lot of innovation and funding in the same because of the heavy cost of production initially and also with reference to storage and transportation costs of generating hydrogen storage and distribution of the same is also very very high so scaling up production is the need of the hour right now next there are safety issues as i already told that this cylinders of hydrogen is actually stored under very high pressures even much more higher than what the pressure is in the cng cylinders and also with respect to the present uh, natural gas pipelines in the country right which can be potentially used for hydrogen uh, uh, you know uh, pipelines these are also not compatible why because of the high pressure requirement of the hydrogen gas and finally hydrogen gas is also highly inflammable so all these three factors are contributing to the safety issues of the uh, same uh, technology then we also find the cost of uh, uh, hydrogen green hydrogen per unit or say per kg is also right now very very high if we take the case of california it is around 30 dollars per kilogram as of 2023 and here to be actually affordable to the rest of the people the cost needs to be coming down to around three dollars to around 6.5 dollars per kilogram by 2030 which is actually very very high challenge or a steep challenge for the producers of green hydrogen to meet this uh, kind of uh, thing and finally we also have these evs electronic vehicles which are based on battery technologies they are also trying to innovate their uh, technologies they are they are trying to reduce the size of their battery they are trying to increase the range and efficiency particularly companies such as tesla they are trying to innovate many aspects of the electric vehicles based on battery so this is also giving a competition to the hydrogen uh, vehicles too so it is to be seen what the final outcomes will be but it is a very very welcome initiative by the government of india to actually go for the push of green hydrogen generation in the country now here we have this 2023 pyq that i want all of you again to mention the correct answer in the comment sections
Now in the next article, we'll be looking at the functioning of the parliament uh, because a very beautiful editorial came in the Hindu today. And here, uh, the main uh, aspect of the editorial is how to uh, is how to understand how the parliament is functioning in the recent years. This is very very important for your G, uh, you know prelims where we have Indian polity and governance, and also for GS2 where we need to look at the parliament and the state legislatures and how they are actually functioning. So let me tell you, this is actually a term mentioned in the syllabus and any term mentioned in a syllabus needs comprehensive notes on the scene. So whatever we are going to discuss today, just make proper notes uh, and also the notes are given in your handouts that will be more than enough. Now see, uh, functioning of the parliament is very, very important for the functioning of the democracy in any country. We know that we send our representatives to the Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha and also uh, we send the same at our state legislative assemblies in upper and lower houses, right, directly and indirectly. Uh, and what they do, they actually uh, sit there, they discuss on various national issues and their primary function is to frame national laws and legislations. And that is why we understand the parliament is highly important while we are talking about its functioning. So whatever the amount of days they are actually sitting there and whatever the debates, whatever the discussions, whatever the bills and acts they are actually legislating upon, it becomes a very serious matter of public concern. And if they are not doing the same, in, uh, I mean if the parliaments or say the legislature are not performing properly then we have an issue at hand and here the main aspect is obviously to uh, uh, legislate on union and concurrent list with reference to Indian Parliament also we find that the Parliament is also platform a fora where the uh, executive of the government uh, executive uh, such as the ministers the prime ministers right they are also held responsible for the various actions or say various inactions through various interventions such as the question r zero r and debates of the same so you know these are actually tools and policies which are used by the individual mps or member of parliaments to hold the government of the day accountable for their actions if if if, if they want to uh, even topple the government that is also possible through no confidence motion. So these are the various interventions which are available to the MPs to actually hold the government of the day accountable. Next, they also have control over finances because the budget, annual budget over and also the various control on public expenditures with reference to various committees in the parliaments are also there. So in the same way, they can also uh, uh, hold the government uh, responsible and this is also very, very crucial role of parliamentary functioning. And finally, we also know that parliament is a forum for debate and discussion, right? So these are the various aspects of functioning effective functioning of a parliament but here now if we go on to discuss the various challenges that the Indian Parliament right now is facing firstly we have to observe the trends of the interventions as we can see here uh, you know as as we can see the half an hour discussion the calling attentions have been reducing over a period of time but the short no notice questions particularly during zero hour that has been increasing but we find that there is an overall decrease in both Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha with respect to interventions. When we talk about the productivity of the two houses of the parliament and compare the same from 2004 to 2009 to 2014 till present, we see over a period of time that is on the decline, right? And also the hours spent on legislation business, right? That is also declining over a period of time from 2019. Right. Then also we see uh, when we discuss the uh, cause of Lok Sabha MPs recently being suspended from the houses, that was also increasing over a period of time. Right. All this kind of data is also available in a handout and please do utilize this uh, effectively in your answers too. Apart from the other issues, other challenges, we now see a rising cases of disruption of the normal legislature business in the uh, houses, uh, particularly due to various, uh, you know, uh, non-parliamentary behavior and various other kind of interventions. There are also adjournments which are also, uh, you know, uh, uh, seen nowadays, right, as also we can see here. With respect to debates, the lack of debates is also visibly seen due to the declining uh, aspects of the same. Next, we see uh, majorly sometimes in uh, it has been alleged that the government of the day is also propagating some of the government agenda in the house according to various uh, political critics. Then we also uh, find that uh, there is an under representation of diverse groups uh, such as women uh, representation in the Lok Sabha as we can see compared to nations such as Bangladesh which have even more representation of women in their own legislatures. Right? Then also with respect to the various research and debate and expertise in the house 
that is also on the decline particularly due to lack of research expertise and uh, uh, know how that is uh, present with the individual private members of parliament and finally we also see recently a lack of uh, or say a parliamentary decorum with reference to the unparliamentary behavior nowadays so these are the various challenges which you also can mention in your answers and here uh, there uh, are some outcomes from the 17th Lok Sabha uh, directly from the editorial here and this is generally to respect to the questions that are asked to the various uh, organs of the government here particularly uh, to the office of prime ministers the Lok Sabha questions has been declining over a period of time or say questions means the questions which have been raised by the MPs to the uh, office of the prime minister and the various ministries as also we can see here right with respect to the Lok Sabha the questions are declining the Rajya Sabha only 28 questions have been answered over a range of around 1100 questions next with reference to the ministries of health and agriculture the most of the questions were asked in this uh, with respect to these ministries but also the questions are declining over a period of time next uh, even it is very surprising to note that the ministry of home affairs which is a very very important ministry is even in that not top three list of the most question asked to particular ministries right there has been decline uh, uh, in the various notices as questions framed uh, or question posed to the ministry by 32 percent and also uh, we uh, understand that the only exception is actually the ministry of finance because ministry of finance is actually saying an increasing rate of questions uh, being asked to the uh, government of the day that is actually uh, very very healthy uh, uh, and also is actually raising the amount of awareness of financial sector management in the country and here there is also dwindling or say decreasing usage of interventions such as half an hour short notice calling attention and so on that has also been uh, shown in the graphs and diagrams here now uh, to go forward we have to understand we have to strengthen the role of the parliamentary committees because they have the members from the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha and they have uh, uh, you know sometimes the exclusive membership of Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha sometimes and they scrutinize the entire activities of the government of the day too and we have to strengthen the role of the committees here then there are these issues and suspensions and expulsions from the houses which has to decrease and uh, such strict actions must not be taken at the very first instance the uh, members of the parliament must be given enough time to recoup their mistakes and then improve their behavior next there must be a new committee which we know as a new legislation committee particularly to look into the matches of new legislation or new bills and acts which has been introduced in the uh, parliament here because it has been seen recently that the acts and the bills or say which has been in, uh, in legislatures are being passed without much debate in the houses so accordingly a committee must be set up to entirely scrutinize all the new legislations next uh, uh, akin to the uk parliamentary convention of having a shadow cabinet from the opposition members right we can also practice the same by giving an alternative form of governance to the present government of the day and finally it is to the uh, it, it is the idea of the chief justice of the country to actually uh, have more and more intellectuals and uh, experts in the house uh, of the representatives so that it will be strengthening the scrutiny also the quality of the debates in the same now we come uh, to this article of antimicrobial resistance because according to a recent investigative journalist uh, report it has been found out that a major poultry firm in India is actually uh, you know using a lot of antibiotics to boost its poultry stock. This is very very important for general science and also for GS3 science and technology. Now here we have to understand we take medicines for uh, to, to get rid of various diseases right and the diseases in our bodies and uh, various other uh, animals they are generally caused due to various microbes such as bacteria fungi parasites and uh, various viruses also now we understand when we take medicines we have to follow a proper standard procedure of following a uh, particular say uh, days time duration and so on but often we see that we do not obey those things and often we also see that we use medicines without doctor prescriptions and so on and this widespread use of these medicines which are say unauthorized or say which are not regulated properly by people like us only this is leading to a silent pandemic which we know as antimicrobial resistance which is a phenomena where the microbes are resisting the effects of the medicines because they are gradually becoming resistant to the effect or the beneficial effects of the medicines so 
the threat from it is that nowadays the diseases are actually harder to treat or it is leading to longer illnesses higher medical costs and even death in some cases where particularly in uh, cases of tbs right tuberculosis the medicines are sometimes not even responsive to the disease here and here the main causes as we can see here is due to overuse of medicine or say uh, misuse of the medicines particularly with respect to viral infections we know that viral inf infections generally do not have any uh, you know medicines but still we use medicines antibiotics to get rid of that cold throat and cold sore and so on but again these medicines overuse of uh, of these kind of medicines is actually leading to more and more resistance between the microbes next it is also due to, due to non completion of the course of medicines as prescribed by the doctors and also we are using more and more antibiotics in the agriculture and animal farming where if we use more and more antibiotics here and finally if uh, uh, you know people at the end of the food chain they consume these animals these uh, the the amount of antimicrobial resistance which have been built in these animals they get transferred to the people too right so these are the various sources apart from that also inadequate hygiene at various government hospitals and various clinics they also spread this antimicrobial resistance from one person to another hence leading to characteristics like pandemic and finally uh, the development on the same of new antibiotics on the new lines of antibiotics is also limited in the pharmaceutical sector as of now so that is why the indian government and also at the global stage we have various initiatives to combat this firstly the icmr is actually doing various collaborations with norway and germany and various other nations to research and develop the various uh, formulation drug formulations uh, to combat this next we also find uh, there is an initiative known as antibiotic stewardship program which is trying to fund research and development directly by the icmr in the country next we have initiative of national program on amr containment which is a kind of a surveillance network to actually track and manage monitor the spread of amr in india and we also have have amr surveillance and research network established by the government of india in 2013 next we have national action plan on omr which is focusing on one health approach one health approach is actually an approach where we have to look at the entire health of living organisms as one entity not as say humans animals separately we have to see uh, link uh, all kind of diseases which are arising between the living organisms as one approach then with reference to global initiative we have the who initiative which is known as glass the full from is global antimicrobial resistance and use surveillance system we have the world microbial uh, awareness week which has been continuing since 2015 and finally we have the global point prevalence survey methodology which is trying to track and manage the amr in the world in the final article we'll be discussing about qualified institutional placement where recently a fintech company has raised uh, 1500 crores via qualified institutional placement now you know you know there are various ways for companies to raise new capital or new funds one of the way is actually qip it is a way for listed indian companies who are listed on the stock exchange on the stock exchange to raise funds from domestic financial institu institutions and these institutions are actually mutual funds banks insurance companies or fiis so whenever they wants to uh, say raise new money they will not be issuing new shares they will be not taking new loans but they will be asking these people who are known as qualified institutional buyers to give them the new money and here for this you, uh, the company did not even do pre filing with the sebi right and that is why it makes this kind of borrowing or lending very very faster right and here the company generally use qips obviously to because of its speed of raising capital secondly due to flexibility because the company can gauge the market conditions gauge its valuations in the market and accordingly they can time qips to raise money in the market next it is very very cost effective because there are very less uh, regulatory hurdles particularly from the sebi with respect to this next it has also access to institutional investors the foreign investors and finally the regulations uh, also to the same is from the sebi the sebi has detailed guidelines for qips and it has in those guidelines told about the various eligibility criteria firstly that it has to be listed on a stock exchange for a company to uh, raise qips and uh, the time period for listing must be at least for one year 
Now, finally, we will be wrapping up the session with four important uh, prelim snippet articles on Monetary Policy Committee, Indian Missions in Antarctica, FAO Price Index and finally, the recent RBI initiative for using UPI for cash deposit. Okay. Now, firstly, uh, we come to the Monetary Policy Committee where recently the RBI had uh, uh, you know uh, kept the repo rates unchanged particularly with respect to repo rates we know that it is a monetary policy committee in India which is actually uh, uh, you know meeting time to time to control inflation in India. Under section 45 ZB of the RBI Act we have the uh, monetary policy committee which was constituted in September 2016 and it is trying to achieve the inflation target in India in the range of 4 plus minus 2 percentage that means in India inflation can be in the range of 2 percentage to 6 percentage maximum. The members are 6, 3 from the RBI and 3 which are nominated by the government of India and the uh, chair, ex official chairperson here is the RBI governor right and here are the quorum or say the minimum numbers to be uh, actually gathered for meeting of uh, the uh, monetary policy committee is 4 and they should be sitting minimum of 4 times in a year actually they sit for around 6 times in a year that is why these meetings are also known as uh, bi-monthly MPC meetings because every 2 months they meet for around 6 times a year and they vote via majority. Uh, all the kinds of decisions of the uh, committee is actually put up for a vote where they vote by majority and if there is any uh, uh, kind of a tie in voting the governor of the RBI will be getting the casting vote with respect to any decisions such as changing the repo rate or not such as any other schemes and policies by the monetary policy committee. In the next one we will be looking at the Indian missions in the Antarctica and also the various timeline of the development of India and the uh, missions in the Antarctica. See India's uh, main interest in Antarctica is guided by scientific research, environmental studies and geopolitical interests. The first expedition was in 1981 and then in 1983 India signed the Antarctic Treaty. And later in 2022 actually India passed a national legislation which we know as Indian Antarctic Act to give effect to the Antarctic Treaty for further research activities and so on. The main aspects of this article is actually with respect to the mapping aspect here mainly with respect to Dakshin Gangotri, uh, Maitri and the Bharti uh, missions which are located on the Antarctica. As you can see here these are projected on the map and in 2008 Sagar Nidhi was actually the very first Indian vessel in Antarctic waters. Right? So, these are all the important maps that you need to know. In the next one, we will be looking at food and agricultural organizations price index. As we can see, this is a price index or say the uh, prices uh, increases uh, in the prices of agricultural commodities in the global world which has increased uh, recently, particularly fueled by vegetable oil index, dairy index and meat index. Right Now, we have to look uh, at this index because it is a very very important marker for agricultural commodities all across the world and it has been released by the FAO. FAO is a specialized uh, agency of the UN and it is actually uh, aiming to defeat hunger and improve nutrition food security in the entire world. The headquarters are at Rome, it has 194 members plus the e European Union as a separate member. The sister bodies are World Food Programme and International Fund for Agricultural Development. The various reports are time and again asked by the UPSC. we can see state of the world's forests, the state of world fisheries and aquaculture, state of agricultural markets, uh, commodity markets and state of food security and nutrition in the world. In the final article we will be looking at a recent initiative by the RPI again in its monetary policy committee recommendations here. Recently RBI has told that right now the customers of the banks of the various people right they can deposit cash at cash deposit machines using API instead of using an ATM card or debit card right. You know if you want to deposit cash you have to take your debit cards or say enter card numbers and so on detail uh, account numbers and so on now it will be totally based on. QR codes. So, you will be scanning your QR code on the cash deposit machines and you will be depositing money uh, to uh, any, any account that you want to your own account to your family friends or whatever. Now, here this is facilitated to the UPI which is a real time payment system which has been uh, you know conceptualized by the National Payments Corp uh, Corporation of India which is the main aspect of this is operated by the RBI 
and the Indian Banking Association, which is say consisting of around 10 banks uh, in the country, and it is trying to maintain this ecosystem of the UPI. And here, UPI is totally eliminating the need for traditional banking details such as account number, IFSC code, and so on. So, this was uh, all the articles that were important for discussion today. I thank you all for being a very, very patient audience. So, uh, till we meet again, you solve the quiz in which is coming up. All the best for your future endeavors. Thank you.